Good afternoon and welcome to NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Wallops Island, Virginia. I am NASA Public Affairs Officer Trent Parado, and this is the post-launch briefing for the Orbital One mission. For those of you who are lucky enough to be here at Wallops, or for those of you who watched from uh, from home on NASA TV, you saw a beautiful launch of the Orbital One mission as it began its International Space Station, uh, the route to the uh, International Space Station at 1:07 p.m. today from from right here, Wallops Island, Virginia. Uh, you can follow the mission uh, as uh, as Cygnus is on orbit and begins its uh, route to the International. Space Station at www.nasa.gov slash station. Uh, here to talk about today's launch and a, and a bit of what comes next, we have a number of distinguished guests. Each will provide some brief remarks, and then we'll go to questions and answers. Uh, if you have questions for our uh, panelists, you can uh, you can reach out to us online on Twitter or, uh, or Google Plus using the hashtag AskNASA. Let me introduce our speakers. To my left is Robert Lightfoot, NASA Associate Administrator. Next, we have Frank Culbertson, Executive Vice President of Orbital Sciences. And we have Bill Rebell, Director of NASA's Wallops Flight Facility. And with that, we'll begin with Robert. Okay, thanks, Trent. Um, good to see everybody here. Another very successful day um, at the Wallops Flight Facility. We're really excited about getting this mission off to, in my opinion, a tremendous start. Uh, so congratulations, Frank, to you and your team and Thank Bill you. to the team here at Wallops for, for getting us started on this next mission. You know, this wasn't without some challenges. I think uh, while, while they had some challenges during the count today, as, as we always do, if you, if you back up, these guys were ready to fly back in December, and, and we had the cooling loop problem on the station, and, and the team in Houston and the team on orbit uh, went out and took care of that problem for us. Then we had, I guess I would say, some of the coldest weather we've had in decades that, that, that managed to uh, get us a day, and then if, what, what else but a solar flare? coming our way. Uh, but I think the team persevered through that and, and really hit a huge milestone for us at, from an agency perspective here today with this launch. And, and the birthing on Sunday of the Cygnus spacecraft is going to be really an important event for us because in so doing and, and completing this mission, this will give us two providers to the International Space Station to provide us the cargo and supplies that we need to do all the, the research and the science and the technology that we want to that we want to use this this amazing laboratory for, and coming on the heels of the announcement by the administration yesterday that we're talking about we're, we're going to start working to extend the International Space Station to 2024, this is just great news for us to to actually take full advantage of that the just amazing orbiting platform we have up there, to get us ready uh, as an agency to take those next steps. Um, beyond the Earth orbit to the destinations we want to take people to. So have a, the, a key enabler to that strategy is having commercial partners that can provide us those, that cargo, and today is a big step in that. So with that, I just want to congratulate the team here at Wallops and congratulate the orbital team for doing that, and, and it's just a really exciting day for the agency and for the International Space Station as we move forward. With that, I'll turn it over to the people that did the real work here. Frank, you go ahead and start. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here. It's especially <coughs> exciting to be at a post-launch press conference. Mm -hmm. uh, that's always good uh, when you plan on doing that to the, on this day. Um, it was a, a challenging day, as Robert said, and, and uh, but this is what we do. The, the space flight is hard, and you have to work the issues as they come your way. And uh, you've got to stay flexible. You've got to be persistent, and uh, and you've got to pay attention to detail, no matter uh, what kind of things are coming at you from the sun or from DFOs, which are not aliens, I think. but. Uh, Distance-focused uh, overpressure problems, mm -hmm. or at least analysis. Uh, but in the end, uh, I want to thank the uh, Wallops range officers, the range safety officers, the FAA, everybody who worked on this so hard, including the people who were standing out in the cold deploying the balloons uh, on a frequent basis so we could get analysis right down to the last second. And it was pretty much the last second. But it worked out, and we were able to get a green and, and, uh, and proceed with the launch. I think we have some video that we can roll whenever it's ready to go. I'll try to uh, talk over it a little bit and, uh, and tell you what was going on uh, as, as we launched, and then tell you a little bit about what's coming up in the next couple of days. Um, the countdown uh, went very smoothly. Um, once we got into the last 15 minutes, uh, the team was focused and ready to go. Um, all the instrumentation looked good, and as we lifted off, the uh, Antares was right on its trajectory, uh, accelerating as we expected. And, uh, and as you heard, uh, everything happened pretty much on time. Uh, it accelerates for almost uh, four minutes uh, under the first uh, stage with the two AJ-26 rockets. Uh, and we want to thank our Aerojet uh, partners for all the work they did to make sure those were ready. And uh, our Ukrainian partners from Yuznoy and Yuzmash who built the first stage. Uh, and it worked as, as planned. Um, 
We uh, uh, we heard it in the Launch Control Center. I heard that y'all had a great uh, 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 sound show, really, uh, as you were out at the uh, at the visitors uh, viewing site. Uh, when the wind is out of the east, uh, you get all the acoustics, and uh, it really brings it home what's going on. There's a lot of energy in these rockets, and that's one of the challenging things of spaceflight is you are managing a lot of energy that's uh, being transmitted very fast from potential to kinetic energy, and uh, it's all got to go right, and it's got to happen at the right times. And and you've got to do it over about an uh, 8 to 10 minute period in order to get into orbit. You've got to accelerate to almost 18,000 miles an hour very quickly and you burn a lot of fuel during that time. And, uh, and everything has to go right. So everybody's paying very close attention at this time. Leading up to the launch, um, we did have some challenges. Uh, a lot of it was analytical in terms of understanding what was happening with the solar flare. Dealing with the uh, low temperatures, which were, uh, you can keep it rolling uh, if we have more. Uh, dealing with the low temperatures was a challenge because that's not something, something we expected on the eastern shore. Uh, but we could deal with it, and, and we did, and the, and the team worked together to keep things that needed to be warmed, warmed, and things that needed to be inspected, inspected. And, um, uh, and we were ready to go uh, uh, today. And uh, in fact, we were almost ready to go yesterday, but the, uh, the solar uh, flare kept us on the ground. Um, <coughs> once the first stage finishes its job, uh, we are almost outside the atmosphere, over 100 kilometers, and uh, we separate the first and second stage, separate the inner stage, and then we ignite the second stage. The second stage on this one is a Castor uh, 30B, which is an upgraded version of the Castor 30 we flew on the first two flights, built by ATK, and we appreciate the hard work they put into that. Uh, it again uh, performed just as we expected, right on the money for second stage, and we ended up in orbit where we expected to be. Uh, payload separation occurs about uh, two minutes after we finish the first, the uh, second stage, and that's when we all relax. Um, you see uh, the launch control team paying attention to their consoles and going through the uh, um, their um, uh, instrumentation, uh, watching what's happening. A lot of people get excited when the first stage finishes and think, "Yeah, half the work's done." Um, and but you got to remember, okay, now we got to do the second stage, and then after the second stage. You still got to get rid of that rocket and put that payload in orbit where it's supposed to be so that you can actually do what you intended to do, which is to deliver cargo to the International Space Station. And we are right on the money, if not a little better. Uh, we're in a 218 by uh, 280 kilometer uh, orbit, uh, which is slightly higher than what we needed in order to be on target, uh, well above what we needed in order to do uh, extra maneuvers in order to stay in orbit. So uh, we're in good shape. Frank DeMauro, who's sitting back there, and his team uh, have taken control of the uh, spacecraft. The um, uh, solar arrays are deployed. The power is, is up and, and working. The propulsion system is working, and the spacecraft is under control. And uh, <coughs> we'll do uh, our first burn for uh, continuing or beginning really the, the uh, phasing with the International Space Station so we can catch up with it and, and rendezvous with it in a couple of days. That burn will occur at about, uh, I think, 6.23 tonight. And, uh, uh, and then we'll have a few more burns as we go over the next couple of days uh, while we continue closing in on the station. The actual rendezvous will begin at about uh, 3 a.m. Sunday morning, the 12th of January. Uh, it'll take about uh, three hours for us to, to get close to the station, and then the actual capture will occur at about 6 a.m. Uh, uh, Sunday morning. And that's another exciting time for us as, uh, as you get close to the station and watch, the, uh, you know, watch your spacecraft approach up the R bar, getting closer and closer, bigger and bigger, and you think, I hope it has brakes. And, <coughs> And the station crew knows what they're doing. And they do, and we do have breaks. Uh, last time we stopped at uh, about 10 meters, and, and they did a great job of grappling. We expect it to be the same this time. Uh, the crew will then berth us to the station, and then they will probably will wait until the following day to actually open the hatch and get their Christmas presents out. Uh, but they will, in fact, open the hatch and find a nice picture of C. Gordon Fullerton on the back bulkhead. Uh, this is the SS Gordon Fullerton, named in honor of uh, one of uh, my colleagues and, and our friends at Orbital, uh, Gordon Fullerton, who was an astronaut and also a B-52 pilot at, uh, at Dryden Space Flight Center, who dropped our, our first commercial rocket, uh, the Pegasus, uh, from the un underside of the B-52. So Orbital has a long and productive relationship with Gordon. He passed away about a year ago, and so we miss him, but we wanted to honor his memory by naming the spacecraft after him. Um, we've got about 1,460 kilograms of, of uh, payload 
uh, cargo on board this uh, uh, pressurized cargo module. Um, about 400, almost 500 kilograms of that is uh, what we loaded late. Uh, much of it was science payload. And much of it was student science, student experiments. So uh, the ISS is doing its job to continue to ensure that the next generation is interested in space flight, uh, has the ability to do research in space to get them interested, so that in about 15 or 20 years, you'll have somebody a lot better looking and smarter than us up here to talk about uh, what's going on in space. And um, uh, we, we are proud to be a part of that and to uh, assist the space station in continuing the research that's been going on for over 10 years and, uh, and continue to further the, the boundaries of human knowledge and soon the boundaries of human exploration because the station, if not actually, will virtually be our stepping stone to the rest of the solar system and uh, we're very proud to be a part of that. I look forward to your questions. I'll be happy to answer any of them and uh, now I'm going to turn it over to our center director here, uh, Mr. Bill Robel. Thanks, Frank. Sure. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so a uh, great way to start out the new year, certainly, and we're looking forward to doing this a couple more times this yeah. year, I think. Right. And then, uh, as, as Robert pointed out, uh, with an extension of four years, maybe uh, maybe a number of years down the road after that. So that's all very good news. No, uh, obviously, we're all smiles here, a lot of happy engineers kind of across the area. I just have to echo the congratulations uh, to the teams. Uh, they, they really worked hard at pulling this off. Obviously through some pretty tough weather um, and not all of it terrestrial based, right? So uh, it was just a great effort across the board. Um, a couple of other things to see that are going to be taking place here at Wallops in the, in the coming months is that um, you know we were part of one of the teams that was selected for the uh, unmanned aerial systems uh, test site designation by the FAA. Uh, so we're looking forward to the work that's going to come with that in the future. And uh, we've got some other interesting things also coming up this year. But we're all smiles here uh, as a result of the way things went here early this afternoon. Good show. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, let's uh, start with questions here in the audience. This is a reminder if you're uh, watching from home and you'd like to ask our panel a question, you can do so using the hashtag AskNASA on Google Plus or Twitter. But we'll start right here at Wallops. We'll start with Ken, and then we'll go to Stephen. Let me get a mic to Ken. Universe today. Congratulations on a great launch. It was really beautiful and a great way to start the new year. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So my question is uh, for Frank and maybe Bob. Um, yeah, we did get an extension announced yesterday. So I'd like you to talk. What What does this mean to you as an astronaut? Get an extension to the ISS, but also specifically in some detail, the point that, that Bill Gerstenmaier made yesterday. This lets the commercial providers and others um, plan for the long-term horizon. So how will this specifically help Orbital as a cargo carrier? What, what would you like to do? Thank you. Well, to answer your first question, I think it's fantastic that uh, the uh, administration is committed to, to moving towards extending the station. I know they've got to work with the partners and there's a lot to be done yet, but uh, it's a move in the right direction. Um, I mean, in my opinion, if I had my way, we'd fly it till 2050. Now, if Congress would have to agree to that, I guess, but um, uh, there's really no reason to stop operations on the space station until it completely uh, is no longer usable. And I think it'll be usable for a long time because it's very well built, very well maintained, and, uh, and NASA and their engineers understand it very well, and I think they're operating it superbly. The best thing about it is, is it's now a research center, and, uh, and it is really starting to ramp up. It's not there yet. It's finished as a station and as a laboratory, but the research capability is just starting to, to move in the right direction. So extending it gives uh, not only commercial companies, but researchers the idea that yes, I can do long-term research on the station because it'll be there for another 10 years and I can get some significant data. And I think that's really important for them to understand that it's going to be backed for that long. They won't get cut short uh, in the middle of preparing an experiment or, uh, or flying it. So I think that, that first of all, uh, demonstrates the commitment of the government to continue in to NASA, but also presents a lot of opportunities for a number of people. As far as, as what it means for us and other commercial companies is that, yes, it does allow us to plan long term for what we might be able to do providing a service for NASA in the future. Uh, and also gives us a chance to, to be innovative and maybe invest in some improvements on how we can do this to make it more cost effective, more efficient, uh, turn around time quicker, go more often, Go more often, go a lot more often, Robert, and uh, <coughs> and, um, and and you know, and, and get so good at it that they don't even feel like they have to compete for those next few extensions. We'll just we'll just keep going. 
Uh, that's our position, but we have to see what the government does. Uh, but it really does give us the chance to, uh, to think long term and, and make sure that we can get some return on our investment and that it actually does present a business opportunity that can expand not just